So welcome everyone. This is Ronald Mainados. I would say live from Istanbul and we're very pleased to have you here for our webinar. Uh, we are still waiting for uh, some of our participants to drop in. I just said in our little discussion uh, with the organizing team uh, that this is like in real life. Uh, we are doing this uh, in a very sophisticated technological platform. We will be providing English and Turkish, not Chinese uh, interpretation for this. This is a technical, should I say, inefficiency of the Zoom platform. Uh, and we have uh, more than one discussant. So uh, this is a challenge also for the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and our partners, the Instable Economics Research Institute. And we're very pleased, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that you are joining us on this beautiful afternoon in Istanbul and beyond. Uh, I will now proceed and welcome you uh, very heartfully uh, to this uh, educational program about public opinion on privacy and personal liberties in times of COVID-19. Uh, these are very special times indeed. In normal times, we would not be doing this via the internet, but in real time. And uh, we will talk about uh, how Turkish public opinion on these important uh, principles uh, is today and how it is evolving. Uh, as I said before, uh, this webinar is uh, provided in two languages, in English as I'm speaking now, and you also have uh, the possibility to listen in Turkish. Uh, Zoom provides uh, a Chinese uh, channel. Uh, of course, this is not the case. We will speak in Turkish here. Uh, it is debatable why they're using Chinese. There might be many theories about this, but uh, it's Turkish and uh, it's great that we can provide this service to you. Uh, this being a seminar, an educational program, uh, we will try to have as much interaction and discussion as possible with uh, some uh, dedicated panelists who are prepared for this session. And uh, you ladies and gentlemen who are participating have the chance to join the debate by using the Q&A uh, and the chat channels, which is provided by Zoom. And uh, I can promise that we will do what we can to consider your commentary, but also to answer your questions. Uh, the full report of this study uh, will be available uh, in the report, in the full form of the report uh, early next week. Uh, we discussed this uh, with uh, Turkiye Raporu, uh, who is our partner in this. And so look ahead uh, for this information and many other interesting uh, survey results in this very important publication. If you wish, uh, you can participate also in our debate using social media. We have a dedicated hashtag. The English hashtag is hashtag Turkey COVID poll. So if you want to comment something on Twitter, you are invited to do so. Uh, as one of the organizers, it's my first uh, duty to thank our partners, uh, mainly Chan Selçuki and Ilkem Gök of the research consultancy Istanbul Economics Research. Uh, we've had a very, very productive and constructive and friendly cooperation, uh, and uh, I would like to thank them for this. I would also like to thank our panelists, Professor Bijan Shahin from the Hajtepe University, who many of the liberal participants, dedicated liberal participants, will also know from his prominent role in the Freedom Research Association, an outstanding liberal think tank here in Turkey, and Özgehan Shen Yuva from the Middle East Technical Universities. These two gentlemen will join us later in the program. Also on the show today is an old friend of the foundation, a well-known Turkish columnist and journalist, uh, Bacin Kinanj from the Hurriyet Daily News. And uh, not least also my colleague at the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, Mrs. Laura Kunzendorf, who is helping us put all these logistics together and also will assist in coordinating the discussion later on. Finally, we are discussing this in an intercultural, multilingual, bilingual context. Uh, we would not be able to do this without the professional help of Ms. Karel Barbour, the interpreter, professional interpreter, and her colleague Ilhan Erdem. Uh, so thank you all uh, for your cooperation. And uh, my biggest thank, of course, goes to you, ladies and gentlemen, who, who, who have come here to join us uh, on one yet another beautiful afternoon. Uh, some of you 
maybe like myself, are suffering of a certain Zoom fatigue. And therefore, all the more, uh, I appreciate that uh, you have come here. Uh, but uh, I can uh, announce that uh, uh, you have not come in vain because uh, what we have in store for you later in the program is of major interest and I'm sure you will not leave without the feeling that you have learned something this afternoon. Allow me first to say a few very short words about the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. If you look uh, at the backdrop behind them, you will see for freedom, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation is the liberal foundation from Germany and for liberals uh, of all parts of the world, uh, fundamental rights are the priority, not one priority of many, but the priority. To promote these fundamental rights and to promote individual freedom stands at the center of all our educated programs in the wider sense. This is our mission and also our mission here in Turkey with the foundation has been present since 1991. Everything we do, we do with local partners, uh, and I'm very happy and I'm very proud of our partners, and I'm happy that many of our partners are also joining this program today. Uh, we think, and I personally think it is very relevant uh, to analyze and maybe first to understand the perceptions uh, of the people, of citizens, regarding fundamental rights or the fundamental rights they have. This is very relevant on a national level, but possibly uh, in the next step uh, on a comparative international level. Uh, perceptions, uh, this is a common place, but I want to emphasize this, are influenced by various factors, by political factors, socioeconomic factors, and not at least cultural factors. And I think this is also very relevant and visible uh, if we look at how people, how nations, how different countries uh, perceive uh, the issue of human rights and civil rights and fundamental rights that we're talking about today. Another commonplace, but equally important, is uh, that perceptions depend on prevailing conditions. And uh, these conditions, they change. Uh, the life we live in is a dynamic life. And uh, as we uh, all know, we are living in the midst of a very special phase of history of what many call an unprecedented uh, health emergency, something we have certainly not experienced in recent memory. And this pandemic uh, has massive impact uh, on our political, and our social, our economic, and not least uh, our private situation in any case. And uh, at the same time, and we're now coming to the topic of our session today, we are witnessing unprecedented restrictions and interferences uh, regarding our freedoms, including the right to privacy and other fundamental rights. And this has led uh, to many situations which uh, are highly illiberal, are highly problematic from a liberal perspective, to censorship and to surveillance by government authorities. And it is only natural that liberal people, liberal-minded people and other Democrats are concerned about this. And uh, while there is a broad agreement uh, that these restrictions due to the health situation, due to the health emergency, to our freedoms are needed uh, at the same time, and this is my last point, at the same time it must be clear that all these restrictions must be temporary, they must stop after the health situation is getting better, they must be necessary, and most of all they must be proportionate. And our concern is that not in all cases the restrictions, the limitations to our rights are proportionate. These are my short uh, notes at the beginning, and I'm now very, very pleased uh, to hand uh, the floor to Chan Sechuki, who's been a great partner in this program. Please, Chan. Thank you, Dr. Maynardus. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here, and I see that we have almost uh, 50 participants, so it's very nice to have a, a good crowd here to join our conversation. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Frederick Neumann uh, Foundation for their support that they have provided uh, to our research. Uh, let me say a few words perhaps about who we are and what we are trying to do. 
Istanbul Economics Research is a Istanbul-based public opinion and market research uh, company. Uh, and uh, as a product, uh, a while ago, we have developed TurkiyeRaporu.com uh, in order to, in an attempt to democratize uh, public opinion data. So every uh, month, we do two Turkey-wide surveys and, and publish the results uh, on our website for, the cons for free. Uh, for the consumption uh, of the wider uh, population. And uh, when we have the opportunity, such as these ones, uh, we do uh, particular projects to shed light on uh, some you know, social, economic, and political uh, issues. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, the team uh, on, on the foundation side. Uh, it has been a very smooth collaboration, uh, I can uh, happily say. And uh, hopefully, you will like uh, the outcome. I think this research, as uh, Dr. Maynardus has mentioned, comes at a very, uh, comes very timely, uh, particularly because uh, the liberal uh, values, the liberal order in the general sense, has been under attack uh, for some time now, uh, particularly with the rise of uh, you know, populist uh, leaders uh, across the globe. And in, the, in, the, in this backdrop, uh, we have entered an an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented phase uh, defined by the pandemic and the, the worries and the concerns that have elevated uh, during this uh, time of pandemic have actually uh, led to more uh, varying outcomes vis-a-vis -vis the deterioration of uh, liberal rights. Uh, in general, uh, you know, economic worries have, uh, have been heightened. Uh, public uh, personal safety, both from a security perspective and from a health uh, perspective, concerns have been heightened. And to cope with these, governments all around the world have, up, have come up with uh, different applications for tracking uh, their citizens uh, with the aim of keeping them safe from a medical uh, perspective. But uh, the discussion is really evolving in a, uh, in a fast uh, manner. Uh, in some countries, uh, courts have decided that you know the metadata uh, from these apps cannot be used, say, by police departments. While in some other countries, uh, this has not been the case. In some countries, opt-in by citizens have been much higher than others. But it seems like uh, you know that's why I'm saying that this research uh, comes very timely, as we are, I feel like, uh, at a very critical uh, point in time, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, for the preservation of. Uh, liberal uh, way of life and, and our rights. Now, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to uh, yield the uh, floor uh, to my colleague, uh, Ms. Ilkem Gök, uh, who will be uh, presenting uh, the main findings uh, from this research. Uh, and uh, as Dr. Maynardus has said, uh, on Monday, next week, we will be publishing all the results uh, for uh, all the results on our website, turkiyeraporu.com, but also uh, for anyone who would like to receive the re report beforehand, if you can leave your, uh, you can either uh, leave your email in the chat box and we will be happy to email it to you, or if you'd like to keep your email private, you can email us at info at researchistanbul.com and I'll share it at the chat box again and we will be happy to share with you uh, the, the report uh, via email. So thank you again uh, to our partner, uh, Frederick Norman Foundation, and obviously uh, all of you that have uh, taken the time out of your day uh, to come uh, join us and listen to this, and also our moderator, our uh, contributors, and our interpreters. So uh, Ilkem, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Ilkem Gök. I'm an analyst at Istanbul Economics Research and today I will be sharing you our findings on public opinion on privacy and personal liberties in Turkey. So first I would like to thank the Turkey Office of Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom uh, for their support on this project. Uh, I would like to start by giving a hint of our methodology. Uh, to 1,200 individuals over 18 years old uh, have, ha, has been interviewed using the computer-aided telephone interviews method. These individuals were randomly selected uh, from 12 cities 
each of which representing uh, not one region of Turkey. So here you can see uh, the demographics of our sample. Is it, it is in line with Turkey's population, as you might uh, realize, but because of our weighting process, there is a higher uh, proportion of males relative to females. But uh, as from our previous studies, and this one actually, we know that females and males doesn't differ that much in Turkey in their opinions. So this doesn't affect our results. So I would like to start uh, with our questions. We asked nine questions to our respondents as to their perception on their fundamental rights and privacy issues. In our first question, we asked our respondents to select all of the rights that we pre presented to them that they considered as fundamental rights. And with 65% right to a fair trial was considered to be fundamental by the highest proportion of our respondents. So this is expected actually, because there has been some unfair, unjust trials in Turkey in the past few years that affected uh, most people's perception of Turkish institutions, etc. And freedom of travel followed with 61%. Uh, this is also expected given the uh, COVID-19 curfews and the restrictions on interstate travel. So people are a bit more sensitive in that right now. And you might also notice that only 53% of our respondents uh, considered being able to elect those in power as a fundamental right. This is actually not because they uh, find it not fundamental, but because uh, it is very natural uh, to Turkish people to elect those in power. In fact, uh, Turkey has one of the highest voter turnouts in the world. And uh, we see here that only 47% considered the right to protest or hold meetings as a fundamental right, and it was the least amount. And uh, this is surprising given that this is actually defined under the fundamental rights and duties section of the Turkish constitution. So uh, we might say that here uh, the current political climate affects the perception of fundamental rights more than the laws themselves. So here we see each of the age groups uh, most considered fundamental right and the generation that uh, meaning that the, uh, the young adults who are aged 24 years or, old or younger uh, considered freedom of expression as a fundamental right with 73%. Uh, this sounds promising, but we will see that uh, it is not enough uh, in the following questions. And for 65 years old or older adults, to be able to elect those in power was considered as the uh, most fundamental of the rights. So for the second question, uh, we provided our respondents the same choices, but this time we asked them to rate them uh, according to how important they found uh, to have that, that right in Turkey from one to five, five being the most important. And with 4.11 points, freedom to move and travel was considered as the most important. This is again in line with the current curfews and uh, the interstate uh, travel restriction bans. But what is uh, interesting here is that right to a fair trial received the least amount of points with 3.59 as opposed to the previous question. And when we interpret this result with the other two least point getting ones, which are freedom to peacefully protest and meet and freedom of citizens to criticize the government on media and social media, we see that even though people see them as fundamental rights at some point, they kind of lost hope uh, over the course of actions in Turkey. So uh, given the imprisoned journalists or the lawsuits against people who criticize government or the president himself, uh, people are considering this uh, to not be able to having in Turkey. So here again, uh, we see the age distribution of the responses for this question. And for this question, uh, actually there, is a, there are similarities across the age groups, but we see that only in the 55 to 64 years old group, ability of opposition parties to operate without obstacles was considered as the most important to have in Turkey. But again, in, uh, freedom to move and travel followed closely. What we should notice here is that even though 
uh, freedom of expression for all was considered to be most important for the 18 to 24 years old, they are unaware of what it might entitle, what are included in the freedom of ex expression. Meaning that uh, as to freedom of peaceful protest or criti criticism on government, uh, or making news on criti criticizing government, this, this group was uh, considering these as not important at all. So they, they find freedom of expression important, but as they grew up, they saw a certain kind of freedom of expression in Turkey. They are unable to uh, co cooperate these concepts with each other. And this is also an interesting result. We asked our respondents to what extent they would agree with the statement that the state could restrict their fundamental rights when it deems necessary. And over 40% of our respondents agreed to that statement, meaning that they were agreeing in restriction of their own rights. And only 23% was in disagreement. So this is a result showing uh, the culture of Turkey that has been like this uh, from the beginning of Turkish Republic, not for recent years, but states comes first and individuals comes after that. And uh, we see that there are protests against uh, the, the measurements taken by the governments due to COVID-19 all over the world. And there are no such thing in Turkey because states is considered as more important than the individuals here. So, for the next question, we asked our respondents under which circumstances they would agree uh, under, under extraordinary circumstances, they would agree which of the following uh, measurements to be taken by the government. And we see here that over 50% uh, disagreed with the restriction of the news, which is very promising. But when we look at the other results, we see that 42% agreed the restriction of protests and meetings. This is understandable given the uh, coronavirus situation right now and the protests may leading to contagion of it. But 44% uh, each uh, agreeing to restriction on workings of opposition parties or uh, so, uh, civil society organizations should be further discussed. I'm sorry. Ah. Okay. So for the next question, uh, we asked our respondents under which circumstances would they approve a curfew given the current situations? And only 3% was uh, opposed to curfews under any of the circumstances. And as opposed to that, 77% uh, said that they would approve a curfew in the event of a pandemic. So. Given the current situation, we can interpret that as a 77% approval uh, of the curfews that we have experienced in the past few months due to coronavirus. And we see here that um, close to 40% approval rate uh, was given for the other cho choices, wartime, protests, post-terror attack, and suspicion of a terror attack. But here we can also observe that there's a seven point difference between post-terror attack and suspicion of a terror attack. So people are more likely to approve a curfew or a, any measure to be taken uh, when there is a solid situation rather than the suspicion of it. Because some people might be skeptical of the suspicion of a terror attack, which was the case after the July 15th coup attempt uh, for Turkey. There, there was suspicions and the measurements were taken. So when we inspect uh, the response to this question in accordance with the educational attainment of our respondents, we see that as the education level increases, uh, approval of curfews due to protests decreases. So we might say that as expected, uh, more educated people are more in favor of protests the right to protest. And also this is uh, the case for the suspicion of a terror attack as well. So for the next question, we asked our response, respondents uh, to what extent they would approve uh, a peaceful protest given the subject of the protest. 
And with 3.19 percent, uh, 19 points out of five, the rights of LGBTI individuals uh, was considered the least uh, worthwhile to make a protest for. And I would like to mention here that we use the term homosexual instead of LGBTI because of the unawareness uh, of the abridgment in the Turkish society. And we see here also that March to Increase Minimum Wage or Women's Rights Marches were, mo were the most approved ones. So uh, the tendency that we see here is that whenever the subject is more general, people are more likely to approve a protest, peaceful protest. But whenever the subject becomes concerning the minorities, such as Alevis or Kurdish people marching for education in their mother tongue or uh, LGBTI individuals, the approval rate falls behind. And uh, this table is perhaps uh, one of the most interesting results of our study. Here uh, we see that we see the answers to uh, approval of protests by uh, political affiliations. And the red uh, highlighted cells shows uh, the least amount of approval for each party basis. And uh, the green ones show the, uh, the most uh, approval for each of the subjects by each of the party bases. And so what we see here is that even though there's polarization across political groups in Turkey, uh, when it comes to rights to protest, there is so much similarities between them. There are of course uh, standing out points such as uh, Kurdish people uh, approving March for Education in Mother Tongue by Kurdish people, HDP voters approving this. Uh, is an expected result. Also, Alevi marches to be disapproved by the AK party voters was also expected. But other than that, we see here that the pro-Kurdish HDP voters and the Turkish nationalist E party and MHP voters thought the same subjects uh, were disapproved, disapproval for, uh, to be marched for. This is very interesting. And also we see here that, uh, sadly, all of the uh, political groups uh, were, were uh, opposed to uh, LGBTI individuals defending their rights with a march. So for the third section uh, of our study, we asked questions regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and the privacy issues related to that. Uh, we asked our respondents whether or not they would download uh, an application that is developed by the state after the coronavirus pandemic is over so that the state would be able to track their movements for their well-beings, medical well-beings and their securities. And interestingly enough, 46% said that they would. Uh, this is because um, the digital footprint is a subject isn't discussed in Turkey. People are not asking uh, who might be using my data uh, after that, and they are only concerned about their medical well-being, etc. So, for the last part of uh, this study, we asked two questions that were asked by Pew Research Center previously. Uh, we used that method to be able to compare the U.S. statistics and uh, the ones we found with Turkey. Uh, in the first question of this part, we asked our respondents whether or not they found it acceptable uh, for the state to track the locations of the coronavirus positive individuals so that they would be able to uh, track the contagion of the disease. So 3.4 3 out of five points were given uh, by our respondents and over 30% of our respondents totally agreed, agreed with this uh, implementation. And uh, we see here that it was only 2.95 points in the US. So uh, we can agree that the privacy concerns aren't uh, as much concerning for the Turkish society uh, as our respondents reflecting uh, as, it, as they are in the United States. And for the last question, we asked whether or not it was acceptable for the state to track all of the people, uh, all of the people's locations uh, so that they would track if or not they are abiding by the suggestions of the experts on the coronavirus pandemic. And so uh, even higher 
proportion of our uh, respondents were in favor of such an uh, application. 3.76 out of five points uh, were given to this, um, as opposed to 2.45 points given by the uh, U US sample. So this is the end of our uh, presentation. I would like to thank you all for listening and I wish you all to have a nice day. Thank you, Ilkem, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it's becoming even more interesting after you've read the report and uh, I can only uh, advise those who are interested in the topic to, to, to wait for having the figures in their hands and look at them very careful. Uh, but we will have now a panel uh, which will be moderated by Bach and Yinanj, those who are subscribers to the Korean Daily News, uh, the leading English language publications in Turkey, of course, know her commentary. Uh, and uh, she's a long term friend of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. We're very happy to have you, Bach. And she has two prominent uh, discussions on her side. And without further ado, Bajan, the floor is yours. And I would be happy if you could somehow, amongst our panelists, create something of a discussion. Please, go ahead, madam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meinardus, um, for this introduction. Uh, let me also start by thanking the Friedrich Naumann Foundation um, for uh, supporting this research and for the Istanbul Economic Research for conducting it, uh, uh, actually. Um, I don't want to repeat whatever has been said, but I do believe that this has come at a very timely uh, moment as liberal democracies um, is facing, are facing yet another but unknown uh, challenge. Um, that's why I find it very valuable. And also, thank you very much for um, Ilkan Gök for helping us navigate through the numbers. And with our discussions, we will try to further navigate and make sense of these uh, numbers. Um, I have uh, two panelists from Ankara under normal circumstances. They would have flown from Ankara and come to Istanbul and enjoy the city for at least a day. But I'm an old Ankariot, so I'm not going to brag about Istanbul. Don't worry. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, a Professor Bijan Shahin, whom I've known for some time now. Uh, he is a, a professor of political science in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at Hacettepe University uh, in Ankara. And he's the president of Freedom Research Association. He focuses on the relations between liberal democracy and Islam, the relationship uh, between state and civil society in Turkey. So it's very uh, relevant what he focuses uh, in order for us to understand what this research has said. It is again my pleasure to also um, uh, introduce you, um, uh, uh, Özgehan Şenyuba. Not so much because we've known each other, our path has not crossed actually, but he teaches in the university and the very same department where I have uh, graduated. So he is the associated professor uh, at the International Relations Department in the Middle East Technical University uh, in Ankara. Uh, he works extensively on youth, public opinion, uh, Turkey-European relations, and uh, he worked for more than two decades as a youth worker, trainer, and, and comes from learning mobility field. I find it uh, extremely valuable, his presence, uh, especially as he uh, specializes on, on youth issues because, um, you know, Although Turkey has started to become an aging uh, country, it still has a young population. Therefore, it's imperative to understand the youth in order to understand um, the, uh, the trends uh, in Turkey. Um, I would like to start with uh, Bijan Shahin, um, the, one of the few uh, positive inputs in the uh, research for me was the 51% where they said uh, they don't want uh, no restriction under any circumstances for the, for the news, but the, the rest of the inputs um, were pretty gloomy. Um, I don't want to put uh, any um, words in your mouth, so uh, let's start with your um, comments in order to trigger a discussion. Bijan Hocam. Thank you, Barchan, and thank you, um, Dr. Maynardus, and uh, 
uh, John Bay uh, for this uh, very relevant and successful research. Um, again, it is uh, very um, striking that some of the results, um, uh, unfortunately, um, came out um, once again not very promising. That is, um, especially with respect to the opposition rights, opposition freedoms, um, now I cannot remember the exact uh, figures and numbers, but uh, with respect to uh, presence of non-governmental organizations uh, and opposition parties and also protest rights. These are uh, considered to be non-essential during the extraordinary times. And uh, in fact, um, these are, I think, uh, from a liberal perspective, these are the rights and these are the conditions to overcome the difficulties of um, extraordinary situations. We have a tendency in general in the world, but maybe in Turkey more particularly, that individual freedoms and uh, public safety concerns are in conflict. Whenever there is a threat to public safety, to public health, the first victim the, uh, that is uh, sacrificed usually uh, is individual rights. Uh, it is believed that if we limit individual freedoms, if we put uh, non-governmental organizations under control, if we uh, limit, uh, turn down the voice of opposition uh, parties and protesters, uh, the government will have a better chance of tackling with the uh, threats. However, uh, human uh, experience shows us that uh, individual liberty, in fact, uh, is the biggest uh, panacea, biggest instrument to fight back these kinds of threats. So it is, it is uh, unfortunate. Uh, but uh, to some extent, to, to some extent, uh, it is uh, it is expected. That is, given the uh, so to speak communitarian uh, culture in Turkey, uh, I would say that uh, these these are not very uh, surprising. For now, uh, this this is it for me. Uh, actually, let me just uh, ask you a question because you said um, um, this research shows um, that most of the Turks won't mind restriction over gatherings, etc., under extraordinary times. But um, you know, civil society and opposition parties, the activities of the opposition parties and the activities of the civil society, and um, the right to gather, the right to uh, protest. Um, they are not that much cherished under normal circumstances as well, no? You know, um, even under normal circumstances, uh, these are not seen as, as sacred. I want to um, echo uh, one of the uh, pollsters um, who says, for instance, when your child uh, enters uh, an employment, your parents don't ask you which trade union have you become member of. At least in my case, you know, when I started journalism, my parents didn't ask me which trade union. In fact, at that time, everybody had to leave the trade union in order to continue as a journalist. So um, I was going to ask, e even on, in normal times, um, we have a problem with these uh, uh, fundamental uh, issues, no? Yes, you are right, um, Barchin. I think... Turkish society, maybe as a result of the historical experience uh, since the foundation of Republic, maybe even going back to Ottoman times, um, has not had uh, much experience with respect to uh, being uh, organized, being part of civil society. And, um, and also, you know, these are fundamental to operationalize a democracy. Uh, the democratic experience have been cut off several times in the Turkish Republic, uh, and especially after the 1980 coup, 
there was a big depoliticization, depoliticization of, of the people. And um, individuals have been discouraged from uh, being part of political and social and economic oriented uh, organizations. And um, the right to protest has been disvalued, you know, uh, especially growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, our parents have been uh, telling us that, you know, just go to your classes, don't attend any meetings, don't attend any protests, don't attend, don't become a member. These were shunned uh, by uh, individual, most individuals. In fact, the youth, uh, those uh, under 20 years, uh, 25 years old, have expressed that they cherish um, freedom of expression most. And uh, maybe at, during the Gezi protests, my colleague, I think, uh, also has some expertise on these topics. He may also comment on those issues. We saw some of these young people come out uh, and uh, protest, but majority of the people still, uh, you know, middle-aged and uh, those over 65, they do not consider being part of these broader civil society organizations uh, as fundamental. And at the time of uh, you know, extraordinary situations, when during emergencies, people um, do not have any problems in sacrificing those. I mean, I agree with you uh, in principle. That is, in Turkey, unfortunately, uh, if, uh, ex except for the youth, uh, the middle-aged, and I would say more senior citizens, um, have uh, some reservations about being part of uh, these uh, civil society uh, organizations and protests. And when things uh, get into uh, difficult times, they more easily uh, sacrifice I think, those rights. Uh, Bijan Hoca, thank you. Uh, before going to Özgehan Şenyuva, uh, let me just remind you that uh, you have the Q&A button down uh, the screen where you can um, start little by little putting your questions because in a few uh, moments we will start uh, 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 taking the uh, questions. Um, and um, so Özgehan uh, Şenyuva, if we can have you. Yes, thank you. Um, now, I wonder to what degree you have looked to this research from the lenses of the youth. We've started sort of discussion a little bit from the youth. Um, and um, Bijan Hoca was talking about how after the 1980 coup, um, the generations were sort of um, asked to be a political. Is it, is it also the case for the new generations? Uh, and if you have other comments about the research let's let's hear you about. well thanks uh, and thanks for starting from the youth uh, those are the last part of my notes but i'll start with that and uh, i thank the organizers and turkey Raporu for preparing this extremely important and very timely report because i have a feeling we will be talking a lot more about these issues and the debate already started at a global level and there has been some very interesting contributions from different countries and different contexts. And I'm very glad we are having this debate in Turkey now. Regarding youth, um, I can raise two issues. One is, yes, the report uh, clearly indicates that the younger generations in Turkey are different from their elders and they have a different perspective. And uh, second, I would say is, um, this is not very surprising. Uh, it is rather confirming uh, what we have been seeing at European level. Um, let me elaborate on that. Uh, I have two books now, the advantage of doing this from home. I can go to my library and reach for books. And one is this, Harry Potter. And uh, this has been rather effective. Uh, Mrs. Rowling is the first author to become billionaire. And she wrote and affected a huge amount of generation of young people. But Harry Potter generation is over. So already it's old. What do I mean? Harry Potter is a male 
and he comes from a pure family. Both parents are wizards. I'm not going to give spoilers. I think most of our audience have heard or read about it or watched the movies. But uh, he's a male uh, privileged uh, person, which is in a difficult situation temporarily. But his uh, parents are pure blood. They are magicians. And an elder wise teacher, uh, Dumbledore, comes and saves him. So he's passive, he's waiting to be rescued, yeah? And he's given the whole world and the seven books and all movies is about we're watching him growing up through pain, through loss, but he learns to stand up against the oppressive evil over the seven books, yeah? But this is over because now this is the generation, Hunger Games. Katniss Everdeen is an orphan, it's a she, and she comes from a working family. Father is a miner and died in a mining accident in an oppressive state regime. Yeah? It's not magicians, it's dystopic, the Hunger Games. And she's a rebel, she breaks the laws, she's hunting although it's forbidden, but she doesn't do it to save the world, she does it to feed her family. So what we have in our hands is a classical example of minor politics. Oldu kadar as it is said in Turkish, she's cleaning her street, she's taking care of her family first, and then it leads to a degree that she becomes the independence fighter. So minor politics are on the rise. Young people are not trying to save the world at first step, but they are starting with their local community. So COVID forced young people to stay at home in their localities. They were actually ordered to stay at home under 20. But we have also seen a lot of local initiatives. So one thing I see here is we will see an increase in minor politics. They will start taking care of their neighbors. They will start connecting at neighborhood levels, which already started. They were knocking on the doors of elder people, asking if they need anything. I have seen a lot of organizations. And say the same in Gezi Park. We were witnessing a lot of forums at neighborhood level. They did not try to start a revolution at national level right away, but they were discussing their neighborhood level. So I think young people are more engaged, but they are not going to be looking for an elder man to come and save them. That's why they are staying away from organized party politics, but they are getting organized among themselves. And they are more inclusive. There are several research uh, made in Turkey about local initiatives, this minor politics, soup kitchens. There are soup kitchens in Ankara. Young people are collecting food from the bazaars, leftover vegetables and fruits and feeding. Uh, the lot of, a group of young people were killed in a bombing, uh, if you remember, in Southeast. What were they doing? They collected toys and they were taking it to the kids and they were attacked and killed with a ferocious terrorist attack. But what they were doing was taking toys to kids. They were not carrying political banners. They were dancing when they were killed. Yeah? So I think young people are active, young people are different, but they are different in the sense that they are not looking for membership to a party. They are not going to follow a male leader, a wise man anymore, because they are very atomized, they are very individualized, and they are going to take a stand if they are pushed. That's why, and you see it at different levels. So this would be my take on youth. It is different than findings 20 years ago. Their post-materialist values are different and their inclusiveness is different. Look at the study by uh, Emre Erdogan and Pınar Ungan Semerci, polarization in Turkey. Young people are acting and behaving different in a polarized society. Turkey Raporu studies show that this 1824, for instance, has the lowest uh, support for any of the current leaders. You ask them which leader is most likely to take care of things, 1824 says none of them. That's their highest rate. So yes, they are different. They are aware of their rights, but the path they are going to follow is going to be different. So those are my notes about the uh, young people. The others, we can continue. Um very shortly, you want to continue because we don't want to hijack it only by the youth. So if you have other comments to, uh, to add, uh, please go ahead. 
Okay, then I would just uh, remind two things Ed, to what uh, Bijan just said. One was, we see is uh, he made a very good analysis at the individual level, uh, which is, is it good for me or is it good for society dilemma, which is always problematic in Turkey. Sociotropic approaches, which is good for society, is rather weak in Turkey sometimes. Uh, why do you want to join the EU? Why do you want Turkey to join EU? It's good for Turkey or is it good for me is always a clash. But I would add one point here then, is it good for me or is it good for us? Let's not forget Turkey is a super polarized society. So the moment uh, you start defining us versus them, uh, things getting are a little bit blurred. So there is a group of people that it's good for us. So I will say yes, it's good for them. Then I will say no business. So there is like a third category in between. It's a group uh, right, group privacy, but it's my group. So this is something we might want to discuss. The same things have, if my party does it, it's good. My youth branch does it, it's good. If their youth branch organizes a festival, no, it's not good. That's one thing. And one thing I would say is this biosecurity, biopolitics. So I would, um, I, I would give a warning flag about what we have witnessed in the past, uh, which is change of, uh, the moment you shift the concept of security, and you start what is called in, in terminology securitization, the security dilemma that Bijan Hoca rightly uh, underlined, is it freedoms versus security? And security from terrorist attack, we have a lot of evidence, but now we're talking about biosecurity, which is being safe from a disease. Um, is it going to affect the process? How do I mean? When it was uh, security from terror, uh, the normal process goes as there is a crime, authorities have to produce evidence and if the evidence is legit you go for punishment but we have seen at increasing levels a shift to suspicion risk management and prevention rather than proving evidence and then working on potential to prevent these things so uh, you could take people under custody just on the suspicion of their mailings for instance we have seen these issues so I would be worried about this as well. The invasion of privacy and individual rights, uh, is it, could it lead to a shift on the authority's behavior that just a mere suspicion, is it going to be enough to prevent people from traveling, for instance? Yeah? And, uh, or, or gathering, because we have seen that even with the suspicion of terror, lots of organizations have been canceled in this country. So the disease can bring the same application, copy and paste. We, are, we have the suspicion that there is a risk of pandemic, so we're canceling all kinds of events, which is happening. So these prevention policies, are they going to be a punishment by itself? Are they going to be a political act, a biopolitical act that is preventing people? And finally, time and space. These uh, restrictions and invasion of privacy. How long will it last? Who will decide it's safe now? Stop tracking me. And where? Is it going to be okay to track in some cities and is it going to be more free in other cities? And finally, international level, how are we going to react when some countries are going to ask more privacy issues to get visas? Already they are asking our bank names, uh, your mother's occupation, how much money do you have, what is your shoe size? But now they are going to ask, or they might ask, I think they will ask, your health report, your temperature, you know, your, your uh, physical uh, privacy. And what if they say, after entering my country, download this application and report me your body temperature, your blood pressure, whatever. Is this acceptable or not? Or is this, how do we deal with this? So these are the questions I have in mind. But it's, it, this was a very useful report to answer some of them. And I'm very glad we're having this debate. Well, let me be uh, uh, the um, devil's advocate uh, while waiting the questions to accumulate uh, about um, where B. John Shahin has left about when the state comes first and then individual comes second uh, in Turkey. Uh, and here I might maybe um, bring in 
perhaps uh, Daron Ajemolu, the um, uh, prominent economist from MIT, who says, um, you know, in democracies, you can have strong states and strong governments. And in the times of pandemic, uh, maybe uh, precisely because we didn't know what we are facing, this was an unprecedented threat, people started to look more up to their state. And I want to bring the conversation to Turkey. Um, because how Turkey has handled the pandemic, most probably people will think that the jury is out. I do understand the jury is out, it's not yet over. But so far, I have the feeling that the society in general believes that Turkish government has handled, handled it quite well. Um, you might disagree, maybe, but um, let me share a finding from Nilsan, uh, who said that in Europe and in Turkey, people got their news from the pandemic, A, from TVs, two, from social media, three, in Turkey, it was health ministry. In contrast to Europe, Turks used health minister and health ministry's social media accounts more in order to learn about what's going on, etc. So I am wondering that if the conviction that Turkey has um, handled well the pandemic, do you think that will um, facilitate when the state will bring out some uh, um, applications, for instance, that might restrict uh, some freedoms? Who would like to pick up on, on that? Uh, Barchin, uh, that is, uh, let me uh, check if I understood correctly. That is the success of uh, the Turkish government in responding to COVID-19 and especially uh, the image of the health ministry in terms of um, transparency and success may further uh, consolidate state's hand in expanding uh, instruments such as um, digital applications, etc., uh, in its fight uh, against COVID. Are you asking this, whether this is the tendency? This might be the tendency for the future? Uh, yes, what I'm saying is that uh, in, in times of, of crisis, you know, people tend to look at, at, at governments, how they per perform, etc. So I have the feeling that already in Turkey, there is already this tendency to trust more the state. And I have the feeling that because of this, because of the policy um, and the performance, that might sort of even increase further this confidence in state, which might come at the expense of uh, people feeling more for fundamental freedoms. Yeah, I, I understand. Mean, I believe there is such a threat, but any, anyone who wants to jump in, uh, John Selçuki or Ilkem Gök, please uh, feel free to uh, jump in. Uh, and there's also another thing that I find quite interesting. Um, when the, the question on um, when the pandemic is over, would you download an app developed by the state? There is no, no one who is hesitant. You know, the, the, those who said don't know, they are around 4%, um, you know, um, and, and it's divided by two. You know, some people are strictly against, some people are strictly, it's okay. That, I found it interesting as well, by the way. I would have expected some people to say, okay, let me think, I'm not sure, let me find out. Barton, if I may jump in here, uh, perhaps. I think uh, you can uh, rightly underline that uh, there is no discussion as to what a digital footprint print means uh, from a privacy perspective. So I think when people are answering or thinking about these things, they are rather thinking about whether if this would be practical, functional uh, or not. For example, the app uh, that Ministry of Health uh, developed uh, during the pandemic wasn't really a good one. It wasn't really a good one in the sense that it didn't really provide much benefit uh, to, to the individuals. You know, it showed some vague concentration areas for uh, identified uh, infected people, but 
much more more than this it didn't really it, it was a nice screenshot but it wasn't really functional now obviously i don't know how functional it could be but people didn't really find it useful so uh, i think this is why people are actually you know only thinking about these questions if whether if these will be practical functional things that will improve their lives and the way you ask it is you know it seems like it's going to provide some benefits so people are not hesitant but for example perhaps in future study we should ask if there was such an app would you be okay with sharing your data from this app with the police or or with the intelligence uh, let's say now there if you sort of uh, force people to start thinking about the other side of the uh, issue, then I believe, uh, you know, people uh, will opt out of it more. Now, this goes, I think there's a similarity vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, these personal ads online. Very few uh, Turkish people actually have problems with targeted advertising. You know, in the recent years, uh, especially Facebook, now on Facebook, if you, if you see uh, 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 an ad, you know, you can also track down who has given that ad and why you have been targeted in particular. Very few people are interested in finding about this uh, information. They are more, let me repeat myself, they are more on the practical side, the beneficial side uh, of this. So people don't uh, look at it from a privacy or fundamental rights uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have a breakup of age. So I would like to ask Özgehan Şenyuva uh, about how would be uh, how he would speculate on youth approach um, uh, to facing these threats in the di digital world. Um, if they were asked this question, um, what would you what would they have said? You know, if they were said, would you download an app developed by the state that has access to your everyday movement data? I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the youth would say because they're more, they're supposed to be more familiar with the digital world and most probably with the threats and opportunities that it uh, involves. Well, I wouldn't speculate what they would have answered, uh, but I, I, I know the research on digitalization and digital youth uh, in Europe uh, there are two categories of people. One is they are already digital native. They are already born into it, so they don't uh, bother. They are already using all these technologies, so it's just one more app in their phone. So they wouldn't care less. But majority of them are careful about these things, so they are searching for alternatives, and uh, they would find a way not to use it. Keep in mind that they start using applications, Facebook, email at much younger ages. So they already have a pile of uh, digital footprint behind them. So they just don't want to add more into it. But can you really avoid it is another question they will ask. Because if your phone, as long as it keeps sending and receiving um, signals, you will be tracked. You know, even if you don't download the app. And there were cases where, uh, in Israel, for instance, uh, there was the case that uh, the, the, for health purposes, the Secret Service was given the, the right to track and share this information. I have shared an article for everybody with uh, examples around the world. I send it through the chat uh, in uh, Panorama. So what I'm saying is uh, there is a sense of being careful, yes, but there's also a sense of surrender because they already know that uh, it is beyond our control uh, how much is being traced and tracked already. So they might not give it voluntarily, but they accept the fact that it is there. So uh, there are different examples. And let's keep in mind that either voluntary or involuntarily, we are already forced to digitalize. How I mean is this. Uh, Normally, we speak of two categories, digital natives and digital migrants. But these days, we also have digital refugees, which were people who normally didn't want to go digital, but because of teleworking, because of online teaching, or even these events, which they would have preferred to go physically, come listen and take notes, in order to follow, they have to download Zoom and join. 
So a lot of people from different age groups were forced to digitalize in this period. And this will have uh, certain changes because now they have the application, they got used to it, and it will continue for a while. Let's not pretend in September we'll go back to organizing this meeting physically, that me and Bijan Hoca will jump on a plane, we'll come to Istanbul, we'll meet one day before. Probably in September, because it's more cost efficient, it's more environmental sustainable, and you can invite more people. And now there are more people who will sit down and listen to it, because in the past that another issue was audience. But now I have checked the... The, the, the attendees, greetings to all. I see some friends and some uh, colleagues that one year ago, if I invited them to a digital seminar, she would have said, no way. But now she has WhatsApp, for instance. So I know some people. And so it, it's uh, opportunities and threats at the same time. But what I'm saying is that let's not pretend in September we're going back to normal. This will continue for some time more and people will be forced to continue telemeeting but can you protect yourself? Is the learning curve on the side of authorities to penetrate and control more? Or is the learning curve on the side of individuals to protect their privacy? My humble opinion, the learning curve is on the side of authorities because now they can test on much bigger universe. More people went digital now, are forced to go digital. And second, there's information sharing. There was a big debate about the uh, CCTVs in London. Are they too many? England is watching Big Brother. Now think, compare the number of cameras in China or the Mobese number in Turkey. And people are happy with Mobeses now because they say, let's check it from there, there's image. So the learning curve and the numbers are on the side of the authorities. Now, can the individuals stop this? Do, will they have the desire to stop this is the question mark. The report says most of them will, will not care and they will be happy that there's a camera watching and people have to show their temperature in the app to ride a bus. Uh, so let's uh, wait, but let's not pretend in September we'll go back. We'll, this, is, this is the way. Uh, Barton, if I may jump in very quickly. Uh... We just looked at the uh, age breakdown of that same question. Uh, and um, it seems like 63% uh, of the uh, respondents between uh, 18 and 24 uh, actually say that they would download the app. Uh, this number is, uh, let me see, 37% uh, for those aged between 25 and 34. But in short, for those between 18 and 24, the number is rather high. Can I just jump in to add something? They would download it, but I would suspect they will try to hack it. That's another behavior. They would not fight against downloading. They would download it, but they would start entering random numbers. They did it in so many things in the past. They hacked it. I'm not talking about the cyber you know, hacker type. They would start entering random numbers. So they would, they would troll it. Troll, that's a better way, yes. They would troll it. They would hijack it, you see? Um, Arjun, may, may I also add something? Go ahead. Uh, going back to your um, uh, reference to Daron Ajamolu's uh, strong state and the necessity of the state uh, and um, its relevance to our discussion, uh, that to the best of my knowledge, uh, Daron Ajemol and his colleagues are using this concept uh, with respect to uh, economic development um, in the sense that uh, a state is a strong state uh, when um, it guarantees uh, basic human rights. Uh, it is built on the uh, rule of law principle and uh, it is a limited government that is it protects the operation of the market economy. It protects uh, the individual rights, property rights, and uh, so provides a framework. In this sense, it, it is necessary and it is strong. But in Turkey, uh, the general understanding when we talk about the strong state, uh, it is rather different. The general uh, approach or, or um, the understanding of the people is that a state 
um, that gets gets uh, gets away with things with uh, even human rights violations is a strong state that is uh, not necessarily related with respecting those rights. And uh, when the state has um, some uh, success with respect to re uh, reducing less numbers, as you indicated, uh, it may even increase the trust uh, and giving more uh, authorities to it. Uh, Bijan Shahin, indeed, actually, I wanted to make a reference to him uh, during my closing remarks. Uh, indeed, I think that um, Jamal, when he sort of favors a strong state, he, I, I think, uh, I would interpret him now, I guess, he says for strong democracies requires maybe strong state, but also strong civil society to have a strong oversight over the, the strong state, which we seem to, to lack in Turkey, because one of the findings which I find it rather interesting is that when it comes to our, to our liberties that touches us physically, directly, that is the freedom to travel, we don't want our freedom to travel to be restricted because it's, it has a direct impact on us. We don't like curfew, it has a direct impact on us. But when it comes to indirect issues like the, op the activities of the opposition uh, parties or the activity of the civil society, we think, okay, they can be restricted because I guess as a, as a society, we still have not grasped that they are there in order to uh, defend our personal uh, freedoms. Now, I have... Uh, Two questions, one comment, you can see the comment over there, but two questions, one is technical. The first one, it says, what was the impact of the Gezi incident on the society and politics is the question for, from Nurkut Inan. And Jihan Dizdaroğlu uh, says, there was a comparison between the results in Turkey and the US during the presentation um, are there any surveys that show the EU citizens' perceptions in terms of freedoms since um, European countries are more sensitive about the freedoms comparing with Turkey or the US? Um, the first question, what was the impact of the Gezi incident on the society and politics? Who would like to pick up? Özgyan Ojan, would you like to go first? Uh, no, I would prefer you to go first. Let me then um, let me do what I studied and worked. Uh, two things is uh, what changed after Gezi is the learning curve of the government. We see an extreme uh, increased activity in social media after Gezi. So uh, what we are dealing with social media, digitalization, digital surveillance, change of laws and everything. Uh, Kerem Altıparmak's interesting findings and analysis on that uh, is that Gezi changed the relation with news consumption, uh, consumption, news production, and community societal communication. And since Gezi, what we are witnessing is an increased attempts of either controlling, but controlling or oppressing is outdated. So what we're seeing, if you look at the international reports, is manipulation and, and hijacking of social media. Uh, so it is not to shut down Ekşi Sözük, for instance, but it is to dominate the discussion Ekşi Sözük and the same in Twitter. So this is one thing I would put, but also I would say, since Gezi uh, and the Penguin uh, crisis, the, the non-Turkey watchers, if they want to know what is the penguin and relation with news, as you can see, but uh, we also see different segments of society uh, completely losing trust to traditional mainstream media and uh, alternative consumption versus some groups watching only mainstream media. So it also polarized news consumption and communication. This is uh, one my two cents on the issue. There are a lot more, but this is just what I wanted to drop. Yeah, uh, one thing that I would like to share is that um, I think um, the 
perception uh, of the youth, especially younger generations, uh, with respect to making an impact uh, via protests and via um, activism in the civil society uh, has increased since Gezi uh, movement. I think um, individuals, especially the young individuals, uh, younger generations uh, who took part and who observed uh, what happened uh, during Gezi uh, protests um, has, I think, more um, confidence uh, and hope, I think, uh, in, uh, in making a difference through activism. Uh, and rather than, as already Özgehan Hoca indicated, uh, not through maybe uh, traditional uh, ways of uh, becoming a member to political parties or other things, but uh, through being active on social media, uh, through being active in the civil society, and if necessary, taking part uh, in activism uh, and taking to the streets. But um, also, we know that the government uh, realized the danger uh, and uh, took many precautions, many measures, made many uh, changes uh, in laws, uh, restricting uh, individual freedoms and punishing more severely those uh, who attempted to, to, uh, to, uh, to protest. However, uh, I think that um, despite this um, restrictions on the part of the government, uh, the, the uh, mentality of the younger generations have been uh, influenced positively uh, in terms of uh, uh, belief uh, in the ability to make a difference uh, with the Gezi movement, I would say. On the technical question, anyone wants to jump in? Uh, Dr. Minardus, maybe I'm going to hand over to you in, in two seconds. Uh, or John Selchuki, do we have uh, any um, surveys that can enable us to make a comparison between uh, European countries and Turkey in terms of the perceptions of freedoms uh, in times of COVID-19? Uh, Barton, I'm sure there are, but we specifically used one from Pew Research Center and that enabled us to compare it to the US because we asked the exact same question. So at this point in time, I'm not able to comment, but obviously that's a uh, interesting uh, path to go down and, and we will look into that to, to be able to provide a, uh, you know, uh, a broader uh, comparison. Well, yes, that if, I, if I may, um, if I may uh, just say a few words, because uh, what, I, what I hinted at in my introductory notes, uh, when I said that these data are very relevant uh, from a national perspective, but of course the relevance is, is equally uh, uh, big when we have an international comparison and we live in a, in a global setting and uh, we are a, a European German foundation uh, working in Turkey and of course we will always uh, encourage uh, interactions between uh, Turkish people and uh, German people and other European people. So, uh, as I said, uh, we are interested also in international comparison. I'm saying this in invitation to Chan, uh, that uh, once we have this uh, uh, settled our this little project, we might want to discuss exactly this, to expand it and to maybe discuss also some form of cooperation uh, with German uh, demoscopic institutes to see what the comparison is. Uh, of course, there are uh, opinion polls, I know from my own country, regarding these issues. And uh, in a nutshell, I can say that privacy issues, from listening to you very carefully, are much higher on the agenda than they are here. It is a major concern, and it is not only a concern to young people. Uh, the uh, so-called tracing app in Germany was introduced only yesterday officially. And this is not because Germany is backward technologically. It is because uh, when this whole thing kicked loose uh, in March or even earlier and the government came out with plans, there was an uproar from civil society. There was an uproar from academia. There was an uproar from the political uh, sphere, also from our own political party, the Liberal Party of Germany. And so they had to take this back. 
uh, and it took them a couple of weeks, a couple of months, now to come up with a tracing app, which was launched, as I said yesterday, and which uh, is, is based on certain, for us, very important liberal principles. And if I may, uh, Bajan, I, uh, I would like to uh, quote them. It's that there's a very high standard of data protection and privacy. It is completely voluntary, so it's not forced on you. And I'm a little surprised, I just found out today, that if I want to use Turkish Airways to fly to Ankara, I have to join this app. This is something which would not be uh, possible in my own country. The data are all the way anonymized uh, and that they are stored only temporarily and decentralized. So there is not uh, any danger, this is, I'm not an expert in this, but there's not a danger that these data may be used uh, for surveillance purposes uh, and there's a very high sensitivity. Uh, maybe, Shihan, uh, they all look great that you are here. Uh, I hope this gives uh, you a certain indication. If I may, uh, and these are my concluding remarks, and maybe Chan can then follow up, because it would be our intention to, to conclude the session on time. Um, uh, my, 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 my very, very important takeaways is that uh, in all these discussions, uh, history and culture plays an important role. It was very interesting to hear from the Turkish speakers that the way uh, the people look at uh, the state is impressed by the historical experiences. I mean, this is a common place, but to have this proven and indicated for me was very, very, uh, very, very important. Uh, also, the, 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 the presentation by Özgehan regarding the youth perspectives I found fascinating. Uh, everybody of us has been uh, youthful and we were rebellious at times. Unfortunately, we were rebellious at times and it should always be this way and youth should always be the position to, to, to wake up old people. Uh, and if you have a certain situation, a political situation, which is, is illiberal, and the youth is the liberal avant-garde, all the better. Uh, uh, kudos to the young people and more power to them. Uh, this is what I want to say. I guess maybe I would like to uh, end with one, 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 one note of caution, maybe, and maybe of one note of, 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 of hope. And, uh, all these, these empirical data, of course, can be interpreted, and we did this, and can be, 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 be commented on different, uh, different uh, levels. But uh, I want to highlight, and this is also an interesting note, we will probably not discuss this today anymore, but have this in mind, to the question whether uh, you would download this app. Uh, at least 49% you know, uh, of the Turkish people responding said no. So, so this is an indication that there is a certain resistance and there is a certain effort also on behalf of the government and the authorities and all others that they're pushing this. But uh, maybe the people are not that stupid and are a little cautious and, and know what they do and uh, what they should not do. Thank you so much. Uh, John, uh, be before you... Uh, uh, go on. Let me just uh, thank uh, uh, my, the panelists, uh, Professor Bijan Shahin and uh, Özgehan Şanyuva um, uh, for their uh, contributions, um, who is leaving me who, with some mixed feelings on the negative side. You know, digital, di digitalization is going to come as an additional uh, challenge to um, uh, liberal democracies. Um, we cannot probably avoid that since the learning curve, as uh, Özgehan uh, Şanyuva has said, is right now favoring the state. But on the positive side, it is good to hear that uh, maybe the youth could be the panacea to that upcoming threat, since they are better equipped, perhaps, than us in circumventing um, uh, this, this challenge. Uh, in the d digital world. And it was uh, good to hear that uh, they are not that apolitical, that they are being organized at least uh, on, on local uh, levers, levels. Therefore, thank you very much for uh, these, uh, my two panelists and, and, uh, uh, and um, Dr. Minardus, thank you very much for, again, for supporting this uh, research. And, and then I'm just going to yield the floor to John Sarchuki. We have a little bit uh, reversed the order, but uh, this is gonna be uh, like that in the Zoom world. Thank you, Bart, and thank you uh, to the panelists. Okay, so let me perhaps uh, finish uh, on a more positive note. I think uh, the initial findings of this research uh, tells us that there is much more than to Turkish society vis-a-vis uh, -vis the liberal value than meets the eye. 
because uh, the, when you look at the data, the underpinnings uh, of the data, there are much more similarities uh, between what would otherwise uh, be considered as a highly polarized uh, society. So, uh, and one uh, last positive remark perhaps is that I think the Turkish society is definitely a couple of steps ahead uh, of, of politicians uh, which are rather stuck in uh, rather shallow political bickering uh, for the better of the past uh, decade. So on that positive note, uh, I think uh, I would like to again uh, thank uh, Frederick Norman Foundation uh, for their uh, support, uh, to both financially, obviously, but also in helping us uh, improve uh, our, our approach uh, and also uh, providing very valuable uh, contribution uh, to our uh, content as well. I would like to thank uh, Ilkem for her uh, brilliant uh, presentation, Barchan uh, for the uh, moderation, uh, and uh, our, our panelists uh, for their uh, very valuable uh, contribution. Now I feel like uh, I have to read uh, Harry Potter. Growing up, I was a Lord of the Rings uh, kid. Uh, was, I was strictly against, uh, yes, that as well, Özgen uh, I was strictly against Harry Potter. I was on the, you know, when there was the divide, I was, I landed on the Lord of the Rings side, but now I feel like I have to read uh, seven of those books and, and one Hunger Games. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.